that it sounds like there's a lot of background noise. I hope that that has cleared up. Um, and it sounds like some of you can hear me perfectly. So I will um, introduce myself. I'm Alice Leiter. I am the Vice President and Senior Counsel at the Executives for Health Innovation. And I am delighted that you've joined us for what is um, our third run through of this HIPAA for Dummies webinar. Now, of course, you are not dummies. No one is a dummy when it comes to HIPAA, but it is a uh, commonly misunderstood law. And the first time we did this webinar, we realized um, how much misinformation there was out there. And particularly now in COVID, when we hear about HIPAA all the time as an excuse for um, not wanting to share health information or vaccine records, or there's all sorts of anxiety about what HIPAA does and doesn't protect, we thought it was a good time to, to re-up this uh, presentation. Um, I will say it is not the most dynamic presentation that EHI puts on. Uh, we very often have roundtables and webinars where there are lots of people who talk and uh, you can see our beautiful faces and those of our colleagues. This is really just going to be me talking at you uh, for the next half hour, 45 minutes or so. So my apologies in advance. Um, I don't think it will take the full hour to run through this. So please do feel free to put questions in the uh, Q&A box and I will do my best to get to as many of them as possible when we wrap up. Um, a little bit about Executives for Health Innovation. We used to be the eHealth Initiative. Some of you may know us by that name. Uh, we recently renamed and rebranded. You can see our new and improved mission here. And we have uh, four primary focus areas of our work, uh, modernizing public health, health equity, virtual care, and I am Mrs. Privacy and Security. Um, I note that these issue areas change depending on what's going on in the world and, and what's going on in healthcare. So um, it's, a, it's a dynamic uh, set of focus areas that we uh, change up every now and then. Uh, here are uh, some of the executives that are members of EHI. Um, I will uh, not pause to have you read all of those, but if you want more information about any of our members or membership, you can visit our website. And here's a little plug for some things we have coming up. Uh, next week, I'm gonna be moderating a um, conversation on data privacy and public health. Uh, we have uh, something on the interoperability rule also coming up. Um, I'm pleased to announce that our consumer privacy, for, uh, consumer privacy framework for health data um, has wrapped up its second year and we are going to be releasing two new reports on the 24th um, and a couple of work groups and other webinars coming up. All of that is on our website. Uh, again, this is my project, so uh, you know, apologies for the plug, but um, I think this is going to be a fantastic webinar. I really hope you all will join us on uh, Thursday the 24th. And we've got a couple of new reports also on our website. Um, hospitals and healthcare systems are increasingly under ransomware attacks. It is um, probably one of the most uh, important and critical issues facing healthcare now, so I urge you all to read and download that report. Okay, now to HIPAA. Um, it is very commonly misspelled. It has two A's, not two P's. It is not the same as a hippo, as cute as this little guy is here. It stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and it is the primary federal law that protects our health information. Um, it, what it really does is govern how information, health information can be used and disclosed. Um, and that information is that that identifies the subject of the information. So it has to be identifiable. It covers only information that's created, received, or maintained by or on behalf of healthcare providers and health plans. And although it's uh, quite often thought of as a restrictive law, it's actually quite permissive. It is designed to allow and facilitate the secure private sharing of health information for health care and delivery purposes. Um, as, most, as with most federal laws, HIPAA is a floor when it comes to um, restrictions on, on information use and sharing. That means that if there's a state law that is more restrictive or more stringent than HIPAA, the state law is that that governs. HIPAA is um, getting a little long in the tooth, a little gray, much like yours truly. It uh, was passed by Congress in 1996. And at the time it was thought of as something that was going to be uh, a revolutionary uh, modernization tool. It was supposed to, um, or was designed originally to improve the efficiency of the healthcare system, improve its effectiveness 
and really modernize the way that information was flowing as more and more of it was becoming digital and electronic. Uh, it also required the creation of national standards that would protect sensitive um, health information and uh, was very focused on making sure that information would not be disclosed without the patient's consent or knowledge. But when we talk about HIPAA, it's most often the, the rules, the regulations that implemented HIPAA. And the one that comes up uh, is most relevant, especially in discussions that you all likely have, is the privacy rule. Uh, the privacy rule, importantly, applies to providers, doctors, hospitals, health plans, health insurers, and healthcare clearinghouses. Um, healthcare clearinghouses were much more relevant back in the 90s when HIPAA was passed. Um, so it's really providers and payers now that are most relevant for our purposes of understanding HIPAA. And those are uh, referred to um, in HIPAA and in the rules as covered entities. Um, the privacy rule sets the limits and the conditions on uh, which the uh, health information can be used and disclosed, and specifically protected health information, which is a defined term under HIPAA, uh, without patient authorization. So if a patient authorizes a disclosure, pretty much anything can happen to it. Patients um, have explicit rights over their health information, including the right to examine it, to obtain a copy of their health mm -hmm. records, and to request corrections if there is an error in the medical record. Uh, another important implementing regulation of HIPAA is the security rule. This established the national set of security standards for protecting health information. And it is a very uh, technical rule. It puts technical and some non-technical safeguards in place that covered entities must have in order to secure uh, the privacy and safety of individuals' electronic protected health information. There are a couple of other uh, rules um, under HIPAA that are, are important and come up in different contexts. The enforcement rule in particular, um, it was a, a newer rule. It was part of the High Tech Act in 2009. The High Tech Act came out of the federal stimulus legislation in 2009. It established the Meaningful Use Program, which some of you may be familiar with, an incentive program to um, speed adoption of electronic health records. But as part of High Tech, um, this, the um, penalties for violating HIPAA were strengthened, both civilly and criminally. Uh, the civil monetary penalties for those who do violate HIPAA were significantly increased. Um, and the Office for Civil Rights within HHS has full responsibility for uh, overseeing HIPAA violations and enforcing um, those, uh, enforcing violations and uh, enacting the civil monetary penalties against violators. If you have ever been a poor, uh, law, a poor um, law firm associate and dealt with a health information breach, you know how many uh, rules and conditions there are for what one must do, what a covered entity must do when there is a breach um, of health data. It requires uh, HIPAA covered entities and any of uh, their business associates, which we'll talk about, to provide notification to a variety of different people and state and federal level entities following a breach of unsecured uh, protected health information. And you can see here the definition of a breach. Um, it's a very specific term, and often there's a, a lot of calculus that goes into figuring out whether or not actually health information has been breached such that all of the notification um, triggers go into effect. All right, privacy rule. It covers and applies to covered entities, which we discussed, healthcare providers and plans, it applies to protected health information, which is defined as individually identifiable health information that is either held or transmitted by a covered entity or its business associate in any form. And individually identifiable is broadly defined. Uh, you can imagine, especially in this day and age, it's pretty hard to get uh, to a place where uh, information is not individually identifiable. So the privacy rule really has broad coverage. A business associate is a term that is not used uh, in sort of common parlance, but it's one of the most important terms under the privacy rule because of how many uh, organizations and entities become business associates by virtue of their relationship with a HIPAA covered entity. So simply put, it's a contractor of a covered entity that performs some sort of service on behalf of the covered entity. And as a result of the service that it's providing, comes into contact with, handles, or stores protected health information. So if you are a contractor of a covered entity and you don't have any access to protected health information, you don't need a business associate agreement. It's when you do have access to PHI that that business associate contract requirement is triggered. Here to me is the more important slide. The privacy rule does not apply to data that is created or held by a person or a company that is not a covered entity. 
So um, if you are not a doctor, hospital, clinic, insurer, or healthcare clearinghouse, and you hold um, if you hold health information, that health information is not covered by the privacy rule or HIPAA. Also, data that is not individually identifiable. As I said, it's a pretty broad it's a pretty broad definition. So much of health information is individually identifiable, but in, but information under HIPAA can be de-identified. And once it's de-identified, once it's stripped of its identifiers, it is no longer covered by HIPAA. And the law sets out very um, specific ways for how data can be de-identified. And there are two ways. Uh, there can be an expert determination. There are all sorts of people out there whose job it is to certify health information as being fully de-identified. Or you can comply with a safe harbor. And that involves the removal of 18 specific types of identifiers. <clears throat> I know I said this, but it bears repeating because there's so much confusion over this. Data that you and I generate is not covered by HIPAA. We as individuals are not covered by HIPAA. If we bring that information to a doctor's office or a hospital or send it to our health plan, it becomes covered by HIPAA because it is now in the hands of a covered entity. But if you think about that, that means that data on your computer, your search engine history, your fitness tracker apps, your fertility trackers on your phone, um, your shopping history on Amazon, all of that information, much of which would be considered health information if held by a covered entity, uh, is not covered by HIPAA if it is not held by a HIPAA covered entity. So uh, very frequently you will see, and I urge you all to follow the Twitter account, Bad HIPAA Takes, but you'll very often see this confusion about the fact that just because there's health data, it's covered by HIPAA. And there are all sorts of law violations by, for example, a restaurant asking you for your vaccination card. No. The restaurant is not a covered entity. We are not covered entities. And so unless that information is held or transmitted or generated by a provider or a health plan, it does not enjoy HIPAA coverage. Um, we have done a lot of work. You heard me talk at the beginning of this uh, webinar about our consumer privacy framework for health data. Uh, health data that is outside the healthcare system is currently woefully underprotected. There is not a law that applies to um, health information outside the health system the same way that it does within the health system. And we and many of our colleagues have been working very, very hard on making sure that there are some strides taken by uh, the private sector while we wait for uh, Congress to pass a new comprehensive uh, data privacy bill that would close some of the gaps for non-HIPAA covered health data. I also note that most employers are not HIPAA covered entities, even if they pr provide healthcare coverage. Um, that's another common misunderstanding. There are, of course, employers that are covered entities, uh, but just by virtue of uh, providing healthcare coverage to their employees does not make an employer covered by HIPAA. It would be the insurer that is the covered entity. So again, and I'm very sorry for beating this very, very dead horse or HIPAA, I'm a hippo, but once data leaves a HIPAA covered entity, either because you take it out on in a manila envelope or because you have asked your doctor to send it to an app on your phone, or because you've asked your doctor to um, hand your mother a copy for her to take home, uh, that data that you have, that information that leaves the covered entity loses its HIPAA coverage. So no uh, privacy rule application, no security rule application, it just disappears into the ether of HIPAA, I should say. So business associates, again, are a very important concept under HIPAA because so many covered entities contract with, <coughs> excuse me, organizations to do all sorts of things on their behalf. That includes claims processing, uh, utilization review, billing services, and then data analysis. As you can imagine, that's a very uh, large, broad category of things um, that is done with the vast amounts of health data that covered entities hold. And again, if that business associate is gonna come into contact with protected health information, which it would um, if it was doing any of these four examples above, it has to enter into what is called a business associate agreement with that covered entity. You cannot uh, have a relationship with a, a contractor that is going to handle PHI without a business associate. And it's a very specific type of contract that involves very specific elements. Um, that business associate agreement has to specify exactly how the business associate will use protected uh, data and will not use that protected data. And by virtue of entering into that agreement, the all of the obligations of the privacy rule extend to the business associate. And so that business associate has to follow all of the same rules that any covered entity would under HIPAA. 
with respect to the uh, protected health information that it's holding. <clears throat> the privacy rule, as I noted, is actually very permissive. It is not a restrictive regulation. Uh, in general, it prohibits covered entities and their business associates from using or disclosing or sharing protected health information unless the privacy rule explicitly permits or requires that use or the individual who's the subject of the information or the individual's personal representative in the case of a, a minor or someone with a healthcare power of attorney authorizes that use and disclosure in writing. You can also verbally request copies of your health information and direct disclosures to other people. Um, so the ability of a person to um, authorize use and disclosure of information is broad, but that authorization has to be uh, explicit and it has to be stored by the covered entity or a business associate in order for uh, sharing of that information to be lawful. There are a number of categories of health information that are permitted under the privacy rule without authorization. And those of us who are HIPAA nerds refer to those purposes as TPO. It stands for Treatment, Payment, and Healthcare Operations. So these are the three big categories of information uh, that, or these are the three big categories of purposes for which individual authorization is not required. The first of those is treatment. And you think about that, it makes perfect sense. When you're in the hospital and you need to be cared for, you don't need, you don't want uh, to have to specifically authorize your doctors to talk to each other, uh, to share diagnoses, um, because that would grind care delivery to a halt. So the provision coordination, the management of your healthcare, the consultation between your various healthcare providers, uh, your patients being referred from one healthcare provider to another, those are all examples of treatment purposes. Again, uh, lawful sharing of individual health information without authorization. The second category is payment. So you can imagine uh, the complexity involved in paying for healthcare services and getting healthcare services reimbursed, premiums, benefits, uh, coverage and eligibility determinations. Those are all permitted under the privacy rule without authorization. And then the broadest category, the O, healthcare operations, is really kind of the kitchen sink of all of the other things that go into healthcare. This involves certain administrative functions, legal, financial activities, um, a lot of quality improvement activities, care coordination, all of the things that a covered entity, a, a hospital, a provider, a payer needs to do to run its business, uh, to support the, the core elements of treatment and payment. Um, you can see staff evaluations, case management, all of that stuff, that also does not require individual authorization uh, for the exchange of protected health information. Um, I'm sorry, we already had this slide. There are other permitted uh, disclosures that are enumerated um, under uh, the privacy rule uh, that does not require patient authorization. Um, I'll read these just because um, there are important categories, and it's, it, these are, again, it's a, a long list um, explicitly in the privacy rule. If, a, if something is required by law, it can be exchanged, it can be shared without individual authorization. There are certain public health activities that do not require authorization. In the case of victims of abuse or violence or neglect, uh, there are exceptions for authorization of the sharing of data health oversight activities, law enforcement purposes. Uh, in the case of somebody who has died, um, uh, sharing uh, when it comes to uh, the organs of those who have been deceased, uh, research is a really important category, a serious threat to health or safety, certain essential government functions and workers' compensation. Again, those are all categories of, of uses and disclosures that are permitted without authorization. So that ends what we're <laughs> going to cover on the privacy rule side. I see that there are a lot of questions uh, in the chat and comments, but so that I don't get distracted, I'm just going to move through this presentation and I'll get to all of those at the end. Um, so again, the privacy, HIPAA has, has not changed um, in some time, but that's not to say that there hasn't been any activity on the privacy front. So here's some new and exciting updates. Um, a couple of summers ago, in July of 2020, there were some changes to what are known as the Part 2 regulations. Um, those are the Confidentiality of Substance Use Disorder Patient Records, form, uh, informally referred to as Part 2. And those changes were designed to better support care coordination and improve the privacy of these very uh, sensitive records. Um, and Congress included legislation to align these Part 2 regulations with HIPAA for these TPO purposes in the CARES Act in the spring of 2020. 
You also may have heard about the CMS and ONC interoperability and information blocking rules. Uh, these implement the provisions of the 21st Century Cures Act, again, a fairly old uh, law, so these were long overdue. And both of the final rules were issued in the spring of 2020 and became effective in the spring of 2021. The delay in uh, implement and the effective date of those uh, rules uh, was due to the pandemic. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the interoperability and information blocking rules because they're so relevant to this issue of non HIPAA covered data that we were talking about before. Then HIPAA was all set to get a facelift um, in the winter of 2020. It was one of the last uh, rules issued by the previous administration. The comment period for that um, rule closed in May of 2021. And they're really the first proposed updates to HIPAA since high tech um, in 2009. Uh, I will also talk a little bit about what's in that proposed rule. But starting with the ONC final rule, these are these informa information blocking interoperability rules. Uh, the ONC rule was really focused on the certification of health information technology and information blocking. Uh, ONC, and I should say that stands for the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. It lives within HHS. Um, the point really of this is to prevent information from being blocked, the information sharing from being blocked. Um, and so the, the rule, um, sets forth some exceptions to what um, constitutes a reasonable or necessary activity, but that also, and that might seem like it constitutes information blocking, but does not. And it established a public reporting system for alleged information blocking. And then the big meat of this rule and why it's talked about so often is that it went a step further and it requires actors covered by this rule, and that includes health information exchanges to make electronic health information available to individuals, patients, and any entity of their choosing. And that includes third-party applications. So to go back to uh, the conversation about health information leaving the healthcare system, this has really accelerated the conversation of the under protection of health data that leaves the healthcare system. Because now when you say to your doctor, please send my medical record to any app of your choosing, there are all sorts of different platforms on your phone that can, um, can store uh, health information and ways that you can have individual pieces of your medical records sent to particular apps. And the, um, the providers now have to do that. Health plans now have to do that. Health information exchanges now have to do that. And that is wonderful. We want information to be liquid. We want information to be flowing. We want individuals to have access to their own data and be engaged in their own care. But it's very important that they recognize that as they, as they make that request, as they ask doctors to share the information, they are also asking, um, they are also taking some sort of risk in that that information loses all of its HIPAA protections. So this rule has really accelerated the discussion around how can we better shore up uh, the protection of all of this sensitive data that is flowing out of the healthcare system. The CMS final rule is um, a little more complicated, slightly less uh, interesting to me on the strict <laughs> privacy side. Again, this privacy nerd of, uh, of bent that I have. Um, these involve the establishment of um, standards-based standards -based patient access APIs. As certain organizations you can see lifted here are listed here are covered by this CMS rule. Um, and uh, CMS really had only one statutory requirement here, and that was to establish appropriate disincentives for a number of categories of providers who were found to be engaged in information blocking. I'll note that we've done a couple of uh, webinars on the information blocking rules, and we have one coming up. So if you'd like more information on either this ONC or CMS rule, there's plenty to be found on our website, and you can absolutely tune into the webinar to hear where we are now uh, about a year out from the effective date. The HIPAA notice of proposed rulemaking was focused on clarifying and amending the existing HIPAA provisions specifically and broadly to facilitate the delivery of coordinated care and value-based care, which is really a trend uh, that we're seeing all across healthcare. Um, the proposed revisions um, expanded the circumstances under which um, and to whom information can be disclosed without authorization specifically for care coordination purposes. You'll remember, I hope, that that is what that's those things fall into the category of uh, healthcare operations. So this is really an expansion of the category of uh, people and circumstances under which information can be shared again without individual uh, authorization. 
There's also a number of, uh, of um, provisions in the proposed rule that strengthen patient access to health, to health information. Some of that involves shortening the time frame um, under which covered entities have to respond to an individual's request for information and provide that information, uh, the right to inspect. Um, there, there are, I really think that patient access, uh, in addition to care coordination, is really at the heart of this rule. Again, we have a whole webinar in the, on the HIPAA Notice of Proposed Rulemaking that you can see on our website. Um, and I, I won't spend too much time going into this now, but um, another big category of the proposed rule was um, really working to decrease administrative burdens. Uh, one of those um, is specific to the notice of privacy practices. Uh, those are those forms that you fill out in addition to your HIPAA authorization form at the beginning of a doctor's visit. Uh, covered entities now ha don't have to store them in the same way or, or obtain them in the same way to really cut down on paperwork and uh, administrative time. Um, you know, everybody, party agnostic, has been uh, very supportive of this update to HIPAA. Uh, the previous administration, the Trump administration, really was pushing to increase the flow of uh, patient information to get health data into the hands of patients and caregivers. This uh, trend toward um, increasing patient engagement in their health and care is really uh, central to all sorts of um, healthcare evolution efforts. and. Um, and was a driving force behind the, the uh, HIPAA proposed rule. Um, it was uh, initiated a couple of years um, prior to the issuance of the, of the proposed rule. The Office uh, for Civil Rights issued a request for information on what needed to be updated with respect to HIPAA. How could we make the sharing of protected health information among health providers? payers, patients, caregivers, how could we make that better? And this, uh, the um, notice of proposed rulemaking really uh, flowed from the responses that OCR uh, received in, in uh, response to its request for information. Obviously also the pandemic <laughs> accelerated attention or increased attention on the HIPAA proposed rule. The issues of privacy and public health have never been more significant or certainly not often talked about as much. And again, given the interoperability and information blocking rules that I just discussed, uh, which are also focused on expanding individual access to health data, you can see that this was part of sort of an overall administrative package uh, to promote the sharing of, of health data. Now, what's interesting, if you'll remember that December of 2020, that was right at the end of the uh, previous administration. The comments weren't due until the spring, <clears throat> but we haven't seen anything really happen with it. Um, it's not on the regular regulatory agenda for 2022. It's unclear uh, whether this rule will ever be finalized. That said, uh, it wasn't a controversial rule. It wasn't one of the rules that the new administration uh, pulled back on immediately as it did with, with a number of initiatives uh, from the Trump administration. So it's really anyone's guess what will happen to it. Um, my personal crystal ball says that as soon as we kind of calm down on the um, on the COVID front and some of Biden's uh, big initiatives uh, get passed or, or resolved, I do think this will come back up. I think that there's momentum building on Capitol Hill for comprehensive federal data privacy legislation. I don't think there will be a whole HIPAA overhaul. I think there will be a new standalone and complementary rule. But I do think that this update to HIPAA, uh, whether or not it takes the shape of a brand new proposed rule or whether this um, existing proposed rule ends up getting finalized, I don't think we've seen the last of HIPAA updates. Uh, again, I've mentioned a couple of times how COVID has sort of thrust um, HIPAA into the national uh, discourse. And uh, you know, from my sort of, I get a kick out of, of, of the misinterpretations of HIPAA, but there are other things that COVID has, um, there are other ways that COVID has been relevant to HIPAA, less so on the bad HIPAA takes Twitter feed front. Um, when COVID uh, happened, uh, there was a public health emergency declared and HHS um, under the terms of the public health emergency relaxed some of its enforcement discretion when it comes to telehealth. Uh, telehealth, of course, is the provision of health care over uh, Zoom, the phone, the computer. Um, and during this public health emergency, which I believe is still in effect, um, health care providers that are subject to HIPAA can now communicate with patients and provide telehealth services through the remote communication technology of their choice, even if that technology is not fully compliant uh, with HIPAA requirements under the security rule and in a way that might not be fully HIPAA compliant under, under the privacy rule. 
Um, there has been some nervousness about, about relaxing that enforcement discretion because of course, enforcement of HIPAA violations is very important, but you can imagine that that the government was focused on getting healthcare, um, getting the provision of healthcare to the people who need it uh, as much as possible, of course, during a, a pandemic, uh, but also because even non pandemic related illnesses uh, or conditions still, of course, occur. And without being able to go to a doctor's office or with hesitance or reticence or, or um, unavailability, this push toward increasing the ability to provide care uh, remotely was incredibly important. So under uh, this enforcement discretion, the Office for Civil Rights will currently not impose penalties for non-compliance with HIPAA rules uh, in connection with the good faith provision of telehealth during COVID-19. Um, there has also been some discussion of trying to keep um, the try to keep the all of the incentives to provide telehealth and to do it privately and securely. We, I think most are in agreement that we really would like to see that continue even when the public health emergency ends. A lot has, of good has come from this relax, um, relaxation of, of enforcement if for no other reason that I think uh, providers and patients feel more comfortable uh, delivering and receiving care remotely. And uh, especially in underserved populations, in rural and remote locations, we want to keep that momentum going. Um, I'll also note that another webinar that EHI had last year was related to vaccine uh, this passports is in quotes because those who are involved with digital health credentials do not like that concept. Um, but the, the uh, digital health credentialing uh, has been along, around for a long time, but with respect to vaccines under, in COVID, um, it has really become uh, much more of a, a valuable tool and certainly something that is discussed uh, much more often. They bring with them associated privacy risks uh, and also associated privacy misunderstandings. So the application of HIPAA to vaccine information and uh, status and whether or not the holder of the information is a covered entity and how digital health credentials are being used under COVID and how they can be used after COVID, all of that is contained in our webinar slides. Once again, I will direct you to our, our website. There's some good stuff there. I mentioned uh, earlier that we are really focused here at EHI on um, what we do about the health data that lies outside the healthcare system. Increasingly, this is where it lives. Of course, it's going to be in the healthcare system, but as I've said, um, there are all sorts of uh, regulations, laws, um, and even just trends uh, that are directing more and more health information out of the healthcare system and into the hands of the individuals. So we talked about how the information blocking rules direct that information must be sent from a covered entity to individuals. Um, and we discussed earlier all of the ways that individuals generate, collect, and store health information that's not covered by HIPAA. So this um, issue of what to do about that, as I said, seems like it is taking on um, some momentum on Capitol Hill, but when specifically is anybody's guess. There was a period before COVID and before the election year that it did seem like a bill might be on the way. Um, of course, the pandemic and the election so, sort of ground things to a halt, but if uh, the dozens and dozens and dozens of briefings uh, to Capitol Hill staff that my colleagues and I have done over the past couple of years about our consumer privacy framework is any indication, um, staff is very focused on this. And I think that a uh, GDPR-like law is on the way at some point. Um, the GDPR is Europe's uh, federal data, Europe's uh, data privacy law, the General Data Protection Regulation. And then as often is the case, when the feds are moving slowly, the states are the ones that pick up the slack. So California, Virginia, there are a few other states that have passed um, consumer protection acts with uh, fairly stringent um, data protections and specific categories for health information. Um, those again are likely to increase in number. Uh, more and more states seem to be working on data protection legislation. And while that's wonderful, as I mentioned at the top of this presentation, these states set the the HIPAA sets the floor and then these states layer on additional requirements. And so for patients who are mobile between states, for businesses that operate in a number of different states, for individuals who move or have care providers in different states, these, uh, these varying state laws can be uh, tricky to figure out. They can overlap in some ways, they can conflict in other ways. And so we, while we of course support states taking action to protect their patients, we really are hoping that uh, the federal government will 
um, act sooner rather than later, because it's better, of course, to have one big law than to have 50 state laws. Um, I'll note that the state laws differ from HIPAA in a number of ways. Uh, they often uh, differ with respect to the purpose of their of why they're implemented. It's really um, both many of these laws are designed to protect personal data, which is very broadly defined versus specifically health data, although some of them call out health data for specific sensitive status. And the scope of the coverage is much broader than HIPAA. Any entity that handles personal information is defined by those laws. So as you uh, we'll remember from earlier that is much uh, broader than the actually relatively narrow scope of HIPAA coverage. And that, if you all are still here, is the end of this particular part of the, of the uh, presentation. Um, the slides from the webinar will be made available on our uh, website in the Executive Resource Center. You will receive an email with direct links um, to all the slides from uh, today's webinar, including a brief uh, survey, um, hoping that you enjoyed this. And now I am going to turn to questions in chat uh, to hope that I can answer the rest of your questions. So bear with me while I read some of these. Um, what components are needed for a HIPAA waiver? Well, I don't really know what a HIPAA waiver is, but a HIPAA authorization does not need to take any particular form. You just need to authorize the sharing of your health information. So you, I guess you could say that that is waiving your HIPAA protections, but as we discussed, any individual authorization to direct health information to the party of your choosing uh, constitutes a, a, a permissible sharing of information under HIPAA. Is a recipient of a limited data set for a research project a business associate? Um, I don't believe so unless he or she has, uh, has um, uh, entered into a business associate contract. Uh, research is a, a whole other webinar. The um, ways in which uh, research purposes are carved out from HIPAA and what a limited data set is um, has all sorts of special rules and, and permit and rules and, and conditions. Uh, but generally, um, sharing of, of limited data sets for research purposes does not involve a business associate agreement. I'm going to pause here to say, as I should have said at the beginning of this webinar, that although I am a lawyer, I am not your lawyer. And I also have, do not have HIPAA right in front of me. And so um, all of these are going to be off the cuff answers that I hope are accurate, but no one should you know, <laughs> take this, these answers to the proverbial, uh, proverbial bank. Um, Again, if you have any specific, more specific HIPAA questions, I love to talk about this stuff. You are welcome always to email me at alice at ehidc.org. All right, I would appreciate your thoughts on if healthcare staff can openly discuss a healthcare staff member's medical conditions, even if that staff member is not a patient. Um, you know, in general, if a healthcare staff is talking about a staff member's medical condition because they are treating them, that is perfectly permissible. If they are talking about a colleague's health condition um, in a, 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 that they have access to by virtue of their job, but they are doing it for just to be, you know, to use an easy example, gossip purposes, no, that's not permitted. Um, I, I, I think um, that it is probably trickier when it comes to um, the working environment in a healthcare uh, setting because of the amount of information that's available, but really the discussion of anybody's uh, healthcare condition, again, information that is obtained by virtue of a treatment relationship really should not be discussed unless it's for those purposes that we discussed earlier, treatment, payment, or healthcare operations. Uh, if not the entire privacy rule applies equally to business associates the way the security rule does. Uh, that sounds right to me. All of the relevant portions of the privacy rule um, that we discussed, the use, disclosure, and sharing, uh, those certainly do pass through. Um, I am happy to look to dig into that a little bit more um, if there are any questions about what specifically if the privacy rule does pass or does not. Aren't providers only considered covered entities if they transmit PHI electronically? Yes, that is true. Um, it, <laughs> there are still, of course, um, clinics and, and uh, provider settings where um, all information uh, is, um, is uh, not electronic. And, and I believe it's um, they're specific to electronic billing. Again, I'd have to look at that, but um, providers uh, who don't use any sort of electronic health information uh, are the very rare exception to HIPAA coverage, you're correct. 
uh, was the part two rule finalized? You know, I was thinking about that right as I went live with this webinar that I had not checked that. I, it, I don't think so. My guess is that it's part of the um, uh, package of, of uh, rules that are sort of in no man's land right now with uh, the relatively new administration, but uh, forgive me for not having a firm answer to that right now. That was a, an oversight on my part. Once PHI leaves covered entity A and is no longer covered by HIPAA, does HIPAA still apply to the same data with respect to covered entity B, C? Um, if data is held by a covered entity, whether it is A, B, or C, yes, it's covered by HIPAA. Um, but if it leaves the leave, if the data leaves the coverage, the data itself loses that protection. So if that same data is stored in three different places. Uh, it enjoys HIPAA coverage in the two places where it remains. It actually enjoys, um, it, it probably still has coverage because it's not actually officially leaving really the covered entity, it probably is still there. It just means that that data, once it's no longer part of the healthcare system, uh, the data itself is not covered by, by HIPAA. Uh, some quality uh, improvement activities are considered part of healthcare operations. Do How do you know if your quality improvement work is part of TPO? That is um, a complicated question and uh, keeps many, many lawyers busy. Um, I Quality improvement uh, activities, uh, in my experience, are very broadly defined. So the likelihood that there's, uh, that there's, um, that it falls into this healthcare operations bucket is strong, but that does require some sort of a, a legal analysis. Uh, let's see, on a recent HIPAA summit panel, an expert stated that should three or four more states pass data privacy legislation, industry may put enough pressure on Congress to final, finally pass a federal comprehensive privacy law. Uh, yes, I believe that that's true. Um, I, I hope that a larger watershed moment would be the reality of today. I do think, though, that because we live in the real world and we all know how Congress operates, it might be that they get <laughs> shamed into action by their more nimble state counterparts. But yes, I do think, you know, I was sort of joking earlier about uh, 50 different state privacy laws. First of all, there are 50 different state privacy laws when it comes to health information and sensitive health data. But if uh, states continue to, to pass these uh, European GDPR-like bills, such as the California Consumer Protection Act, yeah, I do think that there is going to become a critical mass uh, that, that puts pressure on Congress to act. Um, guidance on how to identify, how to identi verify a patient's identity over the phone. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. I do think it's a little bit specific for this call, but we've also done a number of webinars on uh, that involve um, the, con the, the issue of identity verification. So that's a topic that uh, we can dig into offline and that you can poke around on our resource center to see if that, um, if, that uh, if, if you can find the answer to that question. Um, a good resource for state specific laws. Uh, yes, there is, um, I, I, I'm not gonna remember it off the top of my head and I will not dig into my, my Google bar, but if you search for um, state legislation tracker, there is a National Association of State Legislatures or something that has a real time tracker of all of the bills that are in the various uh, state legislatures and their status, whether they've passed, whether they're in committee, whether they are dead. Um, it's a fantastic uh, page. And um, I, again, I Google it all the time and it comes up quickly. So apologies for not being as specific as I can, but it is out there and it is fantastic. All right. Um, how do you distinguish an app that does data analysis, Fitbit atrial fibrillation detection, and isn't covered from a business associate said business associate that does data analysis? Um, again, you know, I don't know. Fitbit is an example. I don't know the extent to which um, various apps have business associate relationships. Um, I think a lot of them do. Uh, very often you'll get an app um, that is affiliated with your provider's office. So what I often think of is a, a, some of these diabetes trackers. Um, and those are, are almost always covered by HIPAA given their business associate relationship that they have with the, the software holder or manufacturer, pardon my lack of tech savvy terms. Um, and so, but again, that, that's not often easily um, gained information. So there are plenty of apps who um, that, that perform health services for an individual that aren't covered and admit it aren't business associates. And it really just depends on the contractual relationship. Um, Inter-facility policies, such as can you leave information on someone's voicemail, those are very um, 
case by case uh, bases. There are all sorts of HIPAA lawyers that work within provider settings that establish individual um, policies for the office. You know, I only know what the rule says that you're not supposed to share information unless it's for certain categories or for certain purposes or for or with um, certain um, certain authorization. But you know, offices run differently. I, I, you can think about your own experience with healthcare providers. It's very often that you will be in the waiting room of a very specific kind of doctor, and someone comes out and yells the person's name to come back, or says your chart is ready, and some of those things, or that you're in an open care setting where you can hear and see other patients being treated. In theory, those are HIPAA violations that are happening all the time, but in practice, an office has to run. So again, um, individual uh, provider offices have their own sets of office policies that are de designed to do their best to protect the pa uh, privacy of patient data. <sighs> Let's see, um, policies on mental health alcohol STD info. Um, I, I can't speak specifically to what HIPAA covers because that doesn't HIPAA doesn't distinguish between certain types of um, sensitive health data, but I can tell you, as I mentioned earlier, that states do. So um, almost every state has uh, laws that apply to specific uh, in certain categories of what we call sensitive health information. So there are provisions in almost every state specific to mental health, reproductive health, uh, substance abuse, genetic information. Um, and so again, those aren't called out or treated any one way or another by the privacy rule in HIPAA, but they certainly are um, by states. Okay, um, if an organization providing non-healthcare to a population hires a consulting nurse to do basic care, does that then make the organization one that is covered by HIPAA? Um, that is a great question. Uh, what I wanna say is that the nurse is covered by HIPAA, not necessarily the organization, but I'd have to think about that. Um, and Denise, I'm happy to, to email with you about that. I, I would wanna think about that a little bit more. I'm sure there's a good answer to that question. The best resource to explain when a reportable breach should be reported to the OCR, that, should, that um, there is a great webpage on the HHS website that is specific to the breach notification rule that sets out in very clear terms all of the specifics for uh, when a breach occurs and then what notice requirements are triggered. So I urge you to, to, to if you Google uh, breach notification rule, you'll go to the, you'll quickly um, find your way to the uh, HHS page that will help. All right, I'm still a little fuzzy on what it means if information leaves a covered entity. For instance, does, does accessing a data system not stored on a covered entity server constitute leaving? If a provider uses an online screening tool they didn't develop or maintain, does that still fall under HIPAA? Uh, again, these are good questions for lawyers. Um, I can just say that what, when we talk about leaving, what we really mean is that when it's transmitted outside of the healthcare system. So what I would think is that accessing a data system, even if it's not on the covered entity server, if it involve, if it's tied to the covered entity or the information is protected health information, yes, that's still falling under HIPAA. If a provider uses an online screening tool that they don't develop or maintain, yes, that still falls under HIPAA because my guess is that those screening tools, um, the, the, develop, the developer or the, the maintainer probably is a covered entity. So again, those are specific questions and I'd be happy to uh, write you a legal memo for many thousands of dollars. But the, the concept is more um, not, is to think of something not, Coming, uh, um, coming outside of the healthcare system. And these examples to me still constitute being in the healthcare system. Can you direct us to more resources that define PHI and other protected data covered by HIPAA? I'll direct you again to um, the HHS website. There are a number of fact sheets on the privacy rule and HIPAA, um, all of the rules that I mentioned. Um, there's some really good resources, uh, both on the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT site and on HHS's site uh, more broadly. So if you Google HIPAA fact sheet or um, privacy rule fact sheet, you, the, that should be one of the first things that comes up. Can people disclose a person's diagnosis if they are not involved in their care? Well, no one should disclose any person's diagnosis if they are covered uh, by HIPAA, if they are a covered entity, except for purposes of treatment, payment, or healthcare operations. Um, if they are not involved in their care, they probably shouldn't even have access to that information at all. Oh my goodness, I think I came to the end of these. All right, now I'm gonna go to Q&A.
this must be the most boring webinar you've ever been on, but I am having a ball. Um, let's see. Okay, it turns out that I did do the Q and A's. I haven't done the chat. So um, I will hope that most of the questions that are here that I'm seeing got moved over to the Q and A box. So that's really good news. It means that I've covered most of these things. Um, and I will look forward to reading through these comments because it sounds, it looks like there was a wonderful conversation going on. Um, thank you for, um, to, uh, thank you to Lisa who put that HHS um, breach notification site in the chat. Um, Emma Valinsky, my colleague, has circulated the link to um, the survey about today's webinar that will also be on our website. Um, and again, my email address is alice at ehidc.org, and you are welcome to be in touch uh, with any of these questions that I didn't cover or more that have come up. Um, I clearly get a kick out of this, and I'm very, very grateful to you all for being here, and we will have the slides to you um, and hope to continue the conversation. Thank you all so much for joining us.